Okay, so price value dynamics with heterogeneous labor, uh, subtitle Marx's first transformation problem. That will become clearer later. So this is work uh, I've been doing for an upcoming book, which is still some time away, but I thought I'd give an update on this relatively self-contained topic. So um, Marx in Capital Volume 1 introduced, introduced a distinction between complex and simple labor. Um, I won't read out the whole quote, but uh, essentially complex labor produces more value than simple labor in the same time. So he writes here, more complex labor counts only as intensified or rather multiplied simple labor. Um, so um, let's put aside for a moment why Marx thought it was important to make this distinction. Instead, let's simply note that he did in fact make it. So... According to Marx, different kinds of concrete activities, such as weaving, tailoring, anything you can think of, they differ in their value creating power. Now, if we accept this distinction, then how can we reduce these different kinds of labor to a common measure? Marx gave some proposals for why, which we'll talk about in a moment, but there's now this problem of reduction of complex to simple labor. And note that this problem is prior to, and it's different from, the issue of heterogeneous labor productivity, which is the issue of relating the concrete time um, of individuals performing the same activity to a measure of socially necessary labor time. That's a, that's a separate issue, right? It's related, but separate. So in this talk, I want to assume homogeneous labor productivity in order to focus on heterogeneous labor types and their potentially different value creating power. And I will investigate this issue by building a dynamic model that captures the essence of the phenomenon. So let's begin. And I want to start with the simple case, the well-established case. It's not controversial in any area of economics, what I'm going to show you. Certainly the equilibrium conditions I will show. The dynamics are um, reasonably novel here. Uh, here we assume that all labor, regardless of its type, has the same value creating power. So let's, um, for the sakes of illustration, consider a small version of the model with only four sectors, each producing a different commodity. And we define the material input output relations between these sectors by a matrix A, which I've done so here. So here's a matrix A with four commodities and the elements define how much of one commodity is used up to make a unit output of the other. And also we need to define more of the conditions of production. We need to define labor inputs that produce commodity outputs. So we define a vector of labor coefficients. The numbers here are arbitrary, I've, I've made them up. And so the first sector requires 0.4 uh, units of labor, hours of labor to produce one output of whatever commodity uh, sector one uh, produces. Okay, so, oops. Okay, so um, that's a bit abstract. So to make it more concrete, we can visualize the economy's technology as a directed graph. So let's do that. And um, let's make it a bit bigger so um, we can see it a bit more clearly. So that's too big. So here are the four sectors. The, the colored um, circles are the four sectors, which I have given names to make them a bit more memorable. We have the first sector, the corn sector. Uh, think of it agricultural sector. Uh, iron sector, think of it as like heavy machinery sector. Uh, linen and coat sector, that relates to some of Marx's examples in volume one, but can think of it as... Uh, consumer goods sectors and uh, the matrix and the uh, labor coefficients is labor homogeneous labor as inputs to all those um, sectors that's the conditions of production and throughout we're going to assume um, that those conditions of production are fixed not true in reality but we're simplifying here to get to the essence of the question we want to answer. So I want to simulate the dynamics of an economy uh, with a nonlinear dynamic model. I'm not going to dig into the details of this model. It would take 
too much time, but it's a stock flow consistent uh, nonlinear model where both prices and the scale of economic activity is endogenously determined. Profit rates determine investment and divestment, which changes the scale of economic activity, and prices, including wages, fluctuate with supply and demand. And in this talk, we're going to make some assumptions. The model is more general than this, but we're going to assume circulating capital only, a conserved stock of token money that circulates uh, in exchange, a fixed size of workforce, um, where we implicitly assume the rate of entry of new people into the labor market equals the rate of exit of older people from the labor market. But the total available workforce is constant. All commodities are reproducible. So issues of land and rent put to one side. Aggregate demand, it has a fixed composition. There's a bundle of commodities that households consume, but the, the, the scale of that consumption varies according to their purchasing power. And importantly for this talk, no interest on money capital advanced. So we haven't got a separate capitalist class extracting profits or, um, uh, from the economy, uh, affecting the uh, prices through an ex ante interest rate, instead profits socialized. So that will allow us to put by construction issues of the real full transformation problem to one side and allow us to focus on the issue of heterogeneous labor in isolation. All right. Okay. So given those conditions of production, we can in fact just simulate the model for uh, 30 time steps. And I'm going to run it uh, live and then I'm going to plot the results. And um, that's all those uh, lines of code do. And it's uh, it's done now. It's quite an efficient um, model in terms of uh, run speed. And there's loads of things we can look at. But first, I want to look at sectoral profit rates over time. So let's plot those. Um, make it a little bit bigger. Why not? There we go. Those are four sectors and their profit rates over time. And we can immediately see that in the long, long run, uh, the profit rates equalize across sectors. In fact, they equalize to zero, indicating the economy is in a steady state equilibrium. We could keep running the economy forever and the, it's in a steady state. Um, there's no incentive for capital to move between sectors in that steady state. And um, all sectoral incomes equal sectoral costs, so there's no, no profits. Now, if profit and investment were not socialized, but instead money capitalists and interest on their capital tied up in the production process, then these profit rates would equalize to the interest rate. But as I've said, we're avoiding issues of the transformation problem. So we're assuming that profit and investment are socialized. So profits in, uh, converge to zero in steady state. And out of the equilibrium, as you can see earlier on in the simulation, the profit rates are fluctuating quite wildly. And for example, the corn sector is initially um, quite profitable. All right, now let's look at the scale of production or the activity levels of each sector. And let me uh, plot that now over time. I want to make it a bit bigger. There we go. So I initialize the activity levels to all start at the same level. So this economy in fact grows in scale over time. And you can see that the corn sector grows the fastest which links to the fact that it had high profit rates at the beginning of the simulation, which attracts investment, which increases the scale of production. But all the sectors uh, grow, eventually reaching a steady state equilibrium, at which point um, final household demand equals the net output of the economy. And that's why um, it's a steady state. All right. Um, what about prices? Let's have a look at how prices evolve. So again, I initialized all prices to be initially the, the same, but they diverge very quickly due to mismatches between supply and demand. And again, they settle down to steady state values. And we expect that given that final household demand becomes constant in the, in the long run. And by assumption, we fix the conditions of production, the technology of this economy. There's no technical progress. There's no revolutions in productivity. 
So the price has settled down to steady values. All right. But what we really care about uh, in this talk is the issue of labor activity and the measurement of value and its relationship to prices. So first, let's look at uh, total employment in the economy. Now, um, the, the L, the yellow L is the total workforce in the economy and the E, the blue line is total em employment. And we can see that the total employment grows over time as the economy grows in scale. More workers are brought into production to produce more things. But um, we don't quite exhaust the entire labor force. In other words, there's reserve army of labor or involuntary em unemployment in the steady state. And, and that's and, and why why this Keynesian result because the economy is driven by a scramble for profit, not the need to employ all the labor force. So if there are no more profitable investment opportunities, then the economy here stops growing, even if there are workers who want to work. Okay, let's look at wages, money wages. They are a function of the uh, supply and demand for labor. So they increase over time as the labor market tightens, again, reaching a steady state value. Right. Uh, now let's look at what we really care about, uh, values and prices. So with this kind of uh, Leontief technology and with homogenous labor, both in terms of the types of labor and their homogenous productivity, then Marx's values are defined by this equation, which is completely standard in the literature and does um, capture Marx's definition uh, in volume one, saying V, the vector V of values for each commodity type, equals the value of the means of production used up in the production of the output. That's what the VA stands for. Remember, A is that technology matrix. So it's the value of the means of production, which is transferred to the output, plus the supply of the direct living labor uh, in the production process. So V equals VA plus lambda is our definition of value in this context. And we can solve for V uh, and calculate the values given the parameters we've chosen. And there we have the value of corn iron, um, linen, and coats. Uh, and it turns out that iron uses up the most vertical, vertically integrated labor time, and therefore iron is the most valuable commodity per its unit output. Uh, we haven't specified what commodity units we're using, but we could. Um, it could be tons of iron. Um, but whatever units we choose, they're the same as the price unit. So if the price of iron is, is per ton, then the value of iron is also per ton, okay? So now let's plot the relationship between commodity values and their prices. So starting with the corn, let's plot it, right? Um, I want to make it a bit bigger. So um, the price of corn is the pink line and it's plotted with um, the value of corn, which we just computed, multiplied by the wage rate, which is the black line. And what we can see here quite clearly is that the price of corn converges to its value multiplied by the wage rate. So let's take a look at um, the iron. Um, we see the same thing, convergence of prices to proportionality with value. Linen, same story, different trajectory in the dynamics, but the same steady state outcome and the same with coats. Okay. And in fact, it's, it's a theorem in linear production theory that with fixed technology and homogeneous labor and, the, and in the absence of capitalist profit, then equilibrium prices are proportional to values. And here we've reproduced that theorem, except we've done it dynamically. This is not linear production theory. In a sense, this is uh, dynamic, nonlinear production theory. We have a dynamic model. So 
So um, we've established this simple case, um, and I'm calling it an arbit arbitrage-free equilibrium with homogeneous labor. Arbitrage-free in the sense that there's uniform zero profits at the steady state. Uh, there's no uh, incentive to try and make more profit by um, reallocating capital. Uh, this steady state is equivalent to static input-output models uh, without interest on money capital. Um, it's a known result in economics, not just Marxist economics. Um, the composition and scale of household demand turns out to be unimportant for determining the steady state. This is called the non-substitution theorem in neoclassical economics. And we can see quite clearly the law of value in action. Values regulate prices. Okay, now let's turn to heterogeneous labor. What? The case we're kind of interested in. Now we've established a simple case, let's move on to what we want to actually investigate. So instead of just one kind of labor, now let's consider four kinds of labor. So we can no longer specify labor inputs with a vector. We, have to, we need a, a, a matrix of coefficients. And here I defined a matrix of heterogeneous labor coefficients. And um, I split labor into, well, this is not, this is very abstract. So let's actually visualize it to make it, it clearer. And um, I'll make that bigger. So it's the same um, technology as before, but we split that homogeneous labor input into four different kinds. We now have um, farming, smithing, weaving, and tailoring. And obviously these are just examples because the model supports as many kinds of sectors and labor types as we, we wish. But here I've kept it small for illustration. And I've just made it a bit more interesting because I've said that say farming, or rather, let me say this differently. The, the corn sector, the agricultural sector requires farming labor and smithing labor. So it's not just one type of labor is required for the production of things. And similarly, the, the iron sector requires farming and smithing. And similarly, for the um, production of linen and coats, require you know a mix of heterogeneous labor types to make it a bit more um, interesting and, and realistic, I guess. Okay. Now, a farmer could, with retraining, become a smith or a weaver or a tailor and vice versa. But why would they? Because over time, workers, if they can, tend to move into occupations where they can earn more money. And this is widely recognized, accepted empirical fact in economics. So in this model, workers switch occupations to higher paying sectors. Um, but of course, this can't happen instantaneously. So I introduce flow rate parameters that controls the speed of this process. So here's a, a matrix of flow rate parameters. And again, we can understand these parameters more clearly if we visualize them as I directed uh, the graph. And um, what we can see is that if you're in any particular occupation, there's always a path, a re retraining path, to move into a different part of the division of labor. But these coefficients are different because um, they control the rate at which that can occur. Uh, for example, here in the parameters I've chosen, it's easier to switch from farming to smithing than from farming to tailoring. And we can assume that educational costs already form part of aggregate household consumption. So educational costs are already forming a part of the real wage of workers, okay? So, um, yeah, so we can get uh, workers now uh, moving around and changing occupations. So let's simulate the economy again, but with heterogeneous labor and see what happens. So I'm running it now live and and plotting and then we can look um at the same things as before so let's look at prices and as we can see um they because all the other parameters have kept the same and um, this is not too different from what we've seen before the prices fluctuate and then 
uh, get to steady state values. Uh, now employment, because that's what we're really interested in. Just as before, employment grows over time, doesn't quite exhaust the um, total labor force. But unlike before, we can see the composition of employment and how that changes over time. So let's look at that. So this plot is stacked. So we can, we're breaking down this employment here into its components. And we can see um, that the composition of employment changes over time. Uh, and in the steady state, most workers are either farming, uh, farmers or smiths, and a smaller proportion are weavers, even a smaller proportion are tailors. And you know it fluctuates over time until it gets to a steady state. All right. Now let's take a closer look at this uh, occupational switching. If you look at farming in particular, now the blue line is the total number of farmers employed. And we can see that there's low. Um, and the yellow line is the total number of farmers available to be employed. Um, uh, and we can see there's, there's low unemployment in farming. And in fact, the number of workers in the farming sector doesn't actually change much from the beginning of the simulation to the end for these particular parameters. OK, if you look at smithing, uh, in contrast, number of workers in smithing uh, does increase over time. There's a movement of the labor force into uh, smithing occupations. And again, there's relatively low unemployment in smithing in the steady state. Look at weaving. Um, uh, number of weavers actually decreases over time. In other words, there was too many weavers at the beginning of the simulation uh, relative to demand, and it decreases uh, to a steady state. Unemployment slightly higher than in other sectors. Uh, tailoring. Uh, at the start of the simulation, there's way too many tailors in the economy, uh, given the final demand and the, and the technology. So workers now dynamically switching occupations. What about the wages? Let's plot the wages now. Right, as expected, wages fluctuate according to the supply and demand for specific kinds of labor. But, and this is the important point, the wages tend to equalize over time as workers switch to higher paying sectors until there's no incentive for them to switch any longer. So if there are no obstacles to labor mobility, even if those switching flow rates were non-uniform, representing uh, different difficulties in moving in the division of labor, wages will eventually equalize nonetheless. So let's now look at values and prices. Now, our previous value equation, it needs to be modified to account for heterogeneous labor because the direct labor coefficients are now of different kinds. Uh, corn production requires both farming and smithing. And so the formula here no longer has a vector, it now has the labor coefficients matrix. And this vector of ones is counting each different kind of labor as equally value creating. That's what we're doing there. And we can calculate these more general values. There we go, we get a vector out. And we can see that the value of corn and, and iron per, per unit are roughly similar. And the value of linen and coats per units are also roughly similar. And we can compare these more uh, general values to prices in the economy. So we'll put corn. And uh, as before, the pink line is the price of corn. The black line is the value of corn multiplied by the, um, the wages in the corn sector. And just as before, the price of iron converges to its value multiplied by the wage. And if you look at iron, you can see exactly the same 
story. Linen, prices and values converge, even with heterogeneous labor, and the same for production of coats, the price of coats. And in fact, we can prove that equilibrium prices are proportional to values, even with heterogeneous labor. So what does this mean for Marx's theory of value? It means that the law of value operates unmodified in the presence of heterogeneous labor. In other words, there's still a tendency for prices to approach values, all else being equal. And they can see quite clearly that the scramble for profit in response to price signals drives the economy to reallocate the total labor power of society to where it's most demanded. And that's the law of value in action. It's the social process that goes on behind our backs that allocates fungible labor power or labor power in the abstract to heterogeneous concrete activities using a social representation of that fungible power, namely money. And this happens whether the concrete labors are simple, complex, require standing on your head or balancing on one leg or whatever. And in that sense, Marx had no need at all to introduce reduction coefficients between kinds of labor, at least given the assumptions we've made so far and the level of, of abstraction of, of volume one. And in fact, the issue of reduction coefficients, the problem of heterogeneous labor can only really arise if the law of value is prevented from fully operating. So let's assert for now that in the pure theory of value with heterogeneous labor, the re Marx's reduction coefficients are not needed. But now let's dig a bit deeper into situations where they might be needed. So we're gonna look at heterogeneous labor with friction and tradition in the economy, in labor markets. Um, and actually Marx himself uses this terminology. So right where he introduces the, the distinction between simple and complex labor, he writes, uh, just before I actually writes, um, the change in the form of labor may well not play, take place without friction, but it must take place. So let's uh, um, explore a situation where this friction of uh, that prevents labor mo that reduces labor mobility is so great that workers can't switch occupations even if they want to for example workers may live in different countries or lack access to the requisite education they may face discrimination in the in the workforce <clears throat> so let's reflect this and modify those flow parameters uh, and in fact, I've set some of the parameters to zero now. So I've cut some of the links. And in fact, now farmers can become smiths and vice versa, but they can't become weavers or tailors for whatever reason. They just can't. And weavers can become tailors and vice versa, but they can't become farmers or smiths. So we've really exaggerated the friction that Marx is talking about. And Marx also writes... The various proportions in which different kinds of labor are reduced to simple labor as their unit of measurement are established by a social process that goes behind the, on behind the backs of the producers. These proportions appear to the producers to have been handed down by tradition. So Marx, on my reading, intended that values explain the structure of steady state prices, especially at the level of, of abstraction of volume one. Uh, and in fact, in volume one, he explicitly states that he's going to assume that prices equal values. But obviously, he was aware of persistent wage differentials between different kinds of labor activity. And prices are affected by wage differentials. So he supposed that different kinds of labor create unequal value in the same time, even when we assume homogeneous labor productivity. And that's why I think he talks of reducing complex to simple labor. Some types of labor will need to create more value 
in the same amount of time if values are still to explain prices. So let's exaggerate the weight of this tradition, which rewards some kinds of labors more than others. And so um, we have initial wage rates, which are parameters to the model, and I'm going to exaggerate them to be more different uh, to begin with. And given that workers can't freely switch occupations, we'd expect these initial wage differentials to persist now in the steady state. So in fact, let's re-simulate with those change parameters. And let's look at the profits and see how they behave. I'm still waiting for it to run and plot. Hopefully it will return soon. There we go. All right, as before, profits equalize to zero in the long run. So there's no arbitrage there for investment. And it's arbitrage free for investment and divestment. Let's look at wages. Different story. Wages no longer equalize. We see that farmers and, and smiths can earn the same in the steady state, and weavers and tailors can earn the same. But farmers and smiths earn more than weavers and tailors. And that's because the economy is now structured in such a way that farmers and smiths are more in demand than weavers and tailors, but workers can't switch occupations. This weight of tradition can't be overcome, and there remains arbitrage opportunities that are prevented from being uh, taken in the steady state equilibrium. So let's now look at uh, values and prices again. Uh, same formula as before, and we can compute them. And in fact, um, the, because the conditions of production haven't changed, the values of commodities haven't changed. We just changed the ability for workers to, to switch and move around. Let's now look at um, corn value versus its price. Now, we see that the value of corn no longer fully converges, rather the price of corn no longer converges to its value. And so value isn't fully explaining the structure of equilibrium prices for corn at least. Same is true for iron, those lines no longer converge. Same is true for linen and corn. In fact, we can prove that equilibrium prices are no longer proportional to their values. So the law of value is prevented from fully operating because workers can't freely switch occupations. Now, this introduces a, a, a mini or a minor or the first transformation problem into Marx's theory of value. Why does it? Because Values are independent of the distribution of wages across occupations. But if there's friction and tradition in the economy, then the equilibrium prices will vary with changes in the distribution of wages. And therefore, values may constrain prices within certain ranges, but it doesn't fully determine prices. Now, in the normal well-known transformation problem, uh, prices of production vary with the distribution of income between wages and profits and independent of changes in the conditions of production. So classical values don't fully explain the structure of equilibrium prices. But here, even in the absence of capitalist profit, prices vary with the distribution of income between different kinds of labor, between workers and independent of the conditions of production. So classical values don't fully explain prices. We have a kind of mini transformation problem. So Anders Eklund in a very useful 2007 paper uh, reviews, reviews uh, Marx's multiple and inconsistent proposals for reducing different kinds of labor to simple or average labor. And I don't intend to um, review Marx's proposals here for the sake of time, but I'll simply assert that Marx doesn't have a a clear answer to this difficulty uh, and that his reliance uh, on, on custom or education costs or labor that produces the money commodity uh, to determine these reduction coefficients are all unsatisfactory. He had a fourth solution, which Anders calls the American solution, uh, where Marx recognizes that the law of value in modern 
capitalist economies like America of his time um, is very dynamic and fluid. And I would interpret it, his American solution as saying, uh, in those circumstances, we have arbitrage free attractors uh, in operation. Uh, so um, my view is that we only need to think about reduction coefficients in the presence of persistent obstacles to labor mobility. So let's uh, just dig into that a bit more. So the obvious solution to this um, mini transformation problem is to use uh, the wage rates as reduction coefficients. So we can recognize the twofold character of labor as simultaneously concrete and abstract, but we can also recognize that its abstract fungible character may be prevented from fully manifesting. So different labor types don't create more value, but they may command more value in exchange. So we can replace this in a sense egalitarian equation for values, which we've computed before, with um, a new equation that weighs different kinds of labor by their wage rates. So we replace that, those ones, with these wage-related reduction coefficients, which we can then compute, which I've done here. Now, um, what this equation is doing is it, transforming the different kinds of labor directly supplied to the production process by their wage rates. And, you know, the value of the commodity in the homogeneous case, it is a mix of different concrete activities due to vertical integration. But we can see that in the heterogeneous case. Um, so here's the the, the generalized value of, of corn in this heterogeneous case, the elements of this mix are weighted by the wage rates, the different wage rates. So we have these mixes, weighted mixes to define um, uh, a value, uh, transform values. So now we can plot again the relationship between the price of commodities and these transform values. And we can see that um, proportionality has now been re-established. Prices are proportion, proportional to these transform values. And the same is true for iron. And the same is true for linen. And the same is true for coats. In fact, we can prove a theorem. We can prove that um, equilibrium prices are proportional to these transformed values. Uh, so if wages don't equalize, um, uh, uh, so if wages don't equalize, prices are proportional to these transform values where the uh, coefficient of proportionality is the average wage. Now, I want to emphasize that these coefficients, they don't reflect um, different value creating powers of the different kinds of labor. They rather reflect unequal exchange between different occupations. So we can actually compute those coefficients in isolation, which I've done so here. Um, we're computing um, these, this vector here, these, these um, transformation coefficients. And looking at the coefficients, we can see that in this example, weavers and tailors command more labor in exchange than they supply to production. That's because they get paid more compared to farmers and smiths. So are these the reduction coefficients that Marx was looking for? Now, Marx, in a footnote where he introduces the distinction between complex and simple labor, he states that, begin quote, the reader should note that we're not speaking here of the wages or value the worker receives, for example, a day's labor, but of the value of the commodity in which his day of labor is objectified, end quote. So no, these are not the reduction coefficients that Marx was looking for. Instead, these wage-based reduction coefficients transform underlying values that count the time of different kinds of labor as equally value creating, and therefore make no distinction between the complex and simple labor. 
And my view is that Marx got himself into a muddle on this issue. And in fact, I think his concept of abstract labor entirely precludes the need for reduction coefficients. But that's an interpretive issue that I won't get into here. And in fact, we can say uh, a little bit more. And if we assume uh, quite reasonably that there is sufficient labor mobility in the economy to be technically defined, I won't go into the details, and the number of concrete labor types is smaller than the number of firms, and most commodities are produced by a large mix of vertically integrated concrete labor types, then we can prove that equilibrium prices, prices are approximately proportional to untransformed values, where the constant of proportionality is the average wage rate. So when it comes to empirical work or macro level laws, then for most practical purposes, the existence of persistent wage differentials simply doesn't matter very much. Of course, it depends on the kinds of questions that are being asked or the kind of outcomes that are being predicted or trying to be created as to whether this approximation is good enough. Uh, but um, yeah, in, in most cases, it makes no difference at all, um, theoretically, and in most in, uh, empirical investigations. And Fajun and Makova already made this point in a different way in their 1983 book, Laws of Chaos. All right, so to summarize, in the case of steady states with heterogeneous labor and incomplete arbitrage, we get this minor or mini transformation problem due to the persistence of wage differentials, but prices are proportional to transform values where the transformation coefficients, not reduction coefficients, transformation coefficients are the wage rates and prices are approximately proportional to untransformed values. And so there's still no role for Marx's reduction coefficients, but there is some role for transformation coefficients, which are the wage rates. So let me now come to a conclusion. Um, stepping out, looking at the bigger picture, are equal causal powers as humans? That is, pick an average laborer, then with retraining, they can form almost any other task in the division of labor. Are equal causal powers as humans manifests in market exchange as a tendency of prices to approach values measured by units of abstract labor. In other words, the law of value holds without modification when labor is heterogeneous. Marx's proposal of reduction coefficients from complex to simple labor, in my view, are theoretically superfluous. Marx should have consistently adopted his American solution, where all labor has equal value creating powers, all other things being equal, and therefore the problem of heterogeneous labor, which has been um, discussed by Marx's critics, um, we can see quite clearly it's it's a non-problem and um, is uh, easily understood and resolved um, with a bit of thought. All right, uh, let me stop there. Thank you for listening.